the, the thing I want you to understand is I want to reform this system not because I'm trying to be mean to people, but because I love people, because I think the current system is keeping people down. I'm Bethany McLean. Did you ever have a moment of doubt about capitalism and whether greed's a good idea? And I'm Luigi Zingales. We have socialism for the very rich, rugged individualism for the poor. And this is Capital Isn't, a podcast about what is working in capitalism. First of all, tell me, is there some society you know that doesn't run on greed? And most importantly, what isn't? We ought to do better by the people that get left behind. I don't think we should have killed the capital system in the process. So, Luigi, here's a simple question for you. What's the most prominent argument against capitalism? I think if we try to synthesize all the arguments we have heard in the last few decades, two words come immediately to mind, poverty and inequality. Everyone has read Tomas Piketty's Capital in the 21st Century. Okay, well, many people at least have it on their bookshelf and pretend to have read it, me among them. Um, The core of the argument is that inequality in the United States and Europe is rising back toward pre-World War I levels. The core idea is that income is stagnant for those in the bottom 50% while it's exploding for those at the top. But it's not just uh, Piketty and Saez. Even the Census Bureau report that the poverty rate in 2021 in the United States after, you remember all the tax child credit that we pay, all the money we pay with the uh, stimulus package for COVID, etc. After all of that, was still 11.6%, meaning that 37.9 million people in the United States were living in poverty. That's almost like four New York cities of people living in poverty. At the same time, according to the Congressional Budget Office, the richest 1% make 84 times as much as the bottom 20% in 2019. But what if that's all completely wrong? So argue former U.S. Senator Phil Graham and economists Robert Eklund and John Early in their book, which is entitled The Myth of American Inequality, How Government Biases Policy Debate. That's a big title, The Myth of Inequality. But the the argument is actually pretty simple. It's not a bunch of complicated economic tinkering or funny econometric modeling. It's it's simple. It turns out in the way the Census Bureau measures poverty and inequality, it doesn't count non-cash transfers such as Medicare Medicaid, food stamps, and refundable tax credits, and more. In 2017, the last year with all the data available, according to Graham, households in the bottom 20% of the income distribution actually received a full $45,000 in government transfers, more than a lot of people receive as their annual salary. So the authors argue that thanks to this payment, the percentage of people living in poverty in the United States has plummeted to only 1.1% in 2015. Their book is also, in part, a policy prescription. The authors write this. The explosion of transfer payments following the war on poverty has caused a significant number of prime work-age persons to become detached from the economy. That disengagement from the world of work has denied them the opportunity to benefit from the extraordinary economic progress that has occurred in the last 50 years and is also the single largest cause of income inequality in post-war America. In other words, people who are getting these transfer these transfer payments just need to get off their butts and work more. They also write that the second largest source of income inequality has been differences in both the quantity of quality of educational attainment. So their prescriptions are very simple and if you want old fashioned is to remove the government disincentives to work by among other things having states implement work requirement for public assistance programs and to reform elementary and secondary education to make sure that maximizes the chance of success of people. So just so our listeners know, this is part of a two-part series we're going to do on poverty and inequality. And we're going to bring in the sociologist Matthew Desmond next for a different perspective. It seems to me that there are two separate arguments in your work, right? One is about inequality, which is nowhere near what people think. And the other is about poverty, which is also nowhere near what people think. Let, let's start with poverty. Can you explain that one to our listeners? Well, part of the problem is in 1947, when the Census Bureau started measuring household income, which is a fundamental statistical building block, of our measure of poverty and our measure of inequality, they didn't have the statistical ability to measure the value of in-kind payments. 
So they counted only cash and cash equivalent payments. Since 1947, especially with the coming of the war on poverty, there has been an explosion of in-kind payments. For example, food stamps. Another in-kind contribution would be where government pays for Medicaid or government pays for rent subsidies. There are over a hundred federal programs where government pays bills, but the Census Bureau does not count the value of those transfer payments as income to people who receive them. Also, the Census Bureau does not take into account taxes, including tax credits. So in total, for poor people, about 88% of all transfer payments from the government are not counted as income in measuring the poverty rate. And when you count that income and you count taxes as income lost, then the picture changes completely in terms of the poverty rate and in terms of income inequality. The value of transfer payments going to the bottom 20% of income earners has risen from $9,700 a year to $45,400 a year between 1967 and 2017. And there have been a series of studies. Bruce Meyer at the University of Chicago has probably done the seminal study where he looked at what people who were in poverty consumed in 1980 and compared that to what they consumed in 2017 and concluded based on consumption, only between two and 3% of Americans in 2017 were poor by the definition of poverty that we had in terms of consuming power in 1980. The Bureau of Labor Statistics numbers show that the bottom 20% of income earners in America consume roughly twice what their income is. Now, how is that possible? Well, it's possible because the Census Bureau is not counting much of the transfer payments that are occurring. Now, one of the reasons why these programs have expanded so much is because uh, there's been a concerted effort to reduce the stigma associated with them and make sure that people who were in need uh, actually use them. So, for example, now we use uh, credit cards and not the older food stamps than older people like Bethany and I remember. You seem to be kind of unhappy with this effort. Why? No, I, I take no position whatsoever on the amount of welfare payments. I take issue with the fact that we don't count their value in measuring poverty. So I'm not taking a position one way or another, whether they're too high, whether they're too low. All I'm saying is that we're getting a totally misleading picture of the number of people in America who are poor. Now, look, two to three percent of the population is not an insignificant amount of the population. There are poor people in America, but in many cases, the poor people have fallen through the cracks because of mental illness or drug addiction. If you've got people that have fallen through the cracks, you've got to find out what their problem is and try to help them deal with their specific problem. Simply adding more food stamps or more rent subsidies or more refundable tax credits won't reach those people. It simply increases the amount of transfer payments going to people who, by the definition that we use for poverty, have not been poor in a very long time. So your argument, in effect, collapses the difference between cash and a transfer payment. But isn't there a difference in the sense that a person has a choice how to spend the first one and no choice at all with, with the second one? I keep thinking a little bit about the famous Marie Antoinette quote that she didn't actually say, let them eat cake. Isn't this a little tiny bit of let them eat Medicaid? No, you can argue that the benefits government provides are not worth what they cost. But you can't argue that food stamps aren't worth anything, which is what the Census Bureau is, in essence, arguing. 
So let, let's now move to the inequality. Uh, it seems that you are suggesting that even on a pre-tax base, the income inequality has not gone up from uh, 1980 to 2017. Is that correct? No. We argue that the pre-tax inequality has risen substantially, in part because the labor force participation rate among the bottom 20% of income earners has declined from 68% to 36%. So earned income inequality has grown, but transfer payments have grown faster than earned income inequality. Taxes are more progressive today than they were in 1967, so that the level of inequality is actually lower today very slightly than it was in 1967, and in fact, slightly lower than it was in 1947. So when people are saying that one of the greatest problems in America is income inequality, they're talking about statistics that don't count most transfer payments at the bottom of the income distribution and don't count any taxes toward the top of the income distribution. If you take both into account, income inequality has actually fallen slightly. Now, I know that's very different than the conventional discussion. You've all heard Bernie Sanders saying that income inequality in America is growing and that that growth is obscene and unsustainable. But the reality is, if you look at the numbers, it actually has declined slightly uh, over the last 70 years. So if you believe in the dignity of work, isn't it still a problem that earned income has diverged so dramatically, even if we agree transfer payments have compensated for much of it? Isn't there a problem with how our modern economy is structured? And I'd point to a 2020 GAO report about federal social safety net programs, and the headline is that millions of full-time workers still rely on federal health care and food assistance programs. Most of them work for private sector employees, and including some of America's biggest companies. So isn't part of the issue Dig dignity of work and the way the way in which the labor market works th these days, such that even people who work full time have to have to get federal safety net benefits. Well, the level of income of bottom twenty percent earners who actually work has risen pretty drama dramatically in the last fifty years. Uh, the value of college education has risen by a very large amount, and the differential between people who have human capital and people who don't have much human capital, uh, it shows up in the marketplace. But the two things that I believe, and the book analyzes and presents statistics on, that we could do to eliminate earned income inequality, or, or to reduce it is a better way of saying, if you had a mandatory work requirement for welfare, to keep people in the labor market where opportunity is and where skills are developed. And if you had a more effective education system, especially in the inner cities, that made it possible for more people from poor families to go to college and gave them the tools when they got to college that allowed them to major in the areas where income is highest, that we could reduce uh, earned income inequality. And look, I think we ought to pursue equality of opportunity as a basic right. Obviously, uh, there are limits to what government can do. If my mother loved me and your mother didn't love you, there's no government program that's going to be able to eliminate that. But providing quality education, and we present the hard data about school choice, I'm not sure that school choice uh, in competition is the best way uh, to deal with failing schools, especially in the inner cities, but it performs better than the public education system that we have now. The statistics are overwhelming and irrefutable that that's the case. 
So Charles Calamiris wrote this in a very favorable review of your book. He wrote, increased earned income inequality is the natural consequence of redistributive policies. If one can enjoy median household consumption without earning any income, the incentive to work is substantially dismissed, d substantially diminished. This largely explains the growing distance between earned and total income for poor households. Do you, do you agree with that interpretation or would you argue there's a little more to it? Well, I think the correlation is very high. When we had the explosion of transfer payments, that we had a precipitous decline in the number of people with relatively low skills who work. The labor force participation rate fell from 68% to 36%. There's no debate about that. Nobody refutes those numbers. And the amazing thing is when you look at the bottom 20% of earners and the second and the middle quintile of earners, the rewards for working are so low that the amazing thing is that 36% of poor people in America work because the returns they get relative to what they can get from all the government programs is relatively small. The bottom 60% of earners in America when you count all transfer payments and you take away all income paid out in taxes, the bottom 60% of Americans have similar incomes. And so the reward for working, uh, if you have a low skill level, is very low. The problem is, of course, if you don't work, you don't get on-the-job training, you don't accumulate skills, and you don't move up as the economy moves up. You can think of the economy as an escalator. If you get on it, the escalator's moving up because of a growth in the economy and productivity. But if you don't get on the escalator, you're just simply dependent on government transfer payments for income. And uh, unfortunately, uh, many poor people in America today are, have uh, fallen into that trap. So in our discussion so far, we've lumped the recipients of transfer payments into one um, homogenous group. But in reality, they're really different because there's the elderly and there are children. And so there are two big sets of people getting non-cash transfer payments who actually can't can't work. So how what what percent of the non-cash transfers are going to the groups of people who can't work? And how does a proposal to add work work requirements help the people who who wouldn't be able to work? Well, first of all, nobody has proposed work requirements for people who are retired over 66, I guess the retirement age is now. No one has proposed work requirements for people who are disabled. All of the requirements I've ever seen from President Clinton on have been requirements that had special provisions for people with young dependent children. But basically, the amount of transfer payments going to people who are not elderly, not disabled, is roughly similar to the amount going to people who are elderly and are disabled. Look, it's not, I, I want people to work because I think it's in their interest for them to work. Now, it's in America's interest, obviously, because we have more people pulling the wagon, fewer people riding in the wagon. But I just can't believe that there is not great benefit by getting into the labor market and using your God-given ability. And my own view is, that there are a lot of people in this country who have real ability that is never discovered. And, and let me just say, I failed third, seventh, and ninth grades. Neither of my parents graduated from high school. I have often said to my mother, who's now passed away, that we were lucky that the welfare program didn't exist when I was growing up. Because if, we, if it had existed, she might have taken it, and our lives might have been different. Now, she argued she would never take it. But the truth is, everyone she would know would be taking it. People would look down on her for not taking it. So I, I want people, I believe there's extraordinary ability in ordinary people. I think in the worst school system in this country, that they're talented people that are never discovered. 
I didn't learn to read until I was in the 10th grade. When I finally learned to read, I could read pretty good. And my guess is there are a lot of people out there that are like me. So that the thing I want you to understand is I want to reform this system, not because I'm trying to be mean to people, but because I love people, because I think the current system is keeping people down. I agree with your idea of the school voucher, your support for the school voucher. But one of the problems with the school voucher is that not everybody has a great mother like you had. And not every kid has a set of parents who look after him or her trying to find the best. And that makes it very difficult for people who don't have those parents to actually get a decent education. So how would you address this uh, shortcoming of the voucher system? Well, first of all, let me say that I never lost a poor boy debate when I was in the Senate. But the plain truth is I had lots of advantages. My grandmother loved me. My mother loved me. My mother was a hardworking person who worked double shift. And I realized that there are not many people who have mamas like my mama. But it seems to me that the more choices you give to people, the more likely you are for them to find the choice that works for them. I don't know what you can do about the fact that some mothers seem more committed to their children's success than others. I grew up in a generation where most mothers lived their lives through the success of their children. I, maybe our, our generation today is similar. Maybe it's different. I don't know. I'm not part of it. But I can't help but believe that giving people a chance to get out of failing inner city schools will give them at least an opportunity to try to find and develop their God-given ability. But none of that will eliminate the fact that some people have good mamas and some people don't. Uh, But I don't think anybody in America is proposing taking children away from their parents or their mama. So, again, it's part of what I say. There there are limits to the ability of government to create equality. And in the areas where we can do it, by getting people in the labor market to discover their ability and giving them access to quality education or at least competition in education, I think we benefit from it. But One thing, like school choice, is not going to solve every problem in America, but I think it's a movement in the right direction, and I'm for it. So recently in our podcast, we had David Otto, who is a professor at MIT and studied the effect of the so-called China shock, the impact that the getting China into the WTO had mostly on the Midwest of the United States in the manufacturing area. His studies suggest that really the devastation that the China shock brought forced a lot of people in their 40s and 50s out of job. These are not people that don't want to work, are people that used to work very effectively and whose opportunities have been dramatically eliminated in a short period of time. And it's not easy at age 40 or 50 to transform yourself from a productive worker to uh, in manufacturing to a nurse or a computer web designer. So are you saying that all these people are just lazy and don't want to work? No, I I never made such an argument. Trade cuts two ways. Obviously, it creates more competition in producing goods and services, but it also provides more competition in supplying them and affects price. Go to a Walmart if you want to see what competition does in terms of prices of goods and services. So that there are people who have had difficulty adjusting. We have had a trade uh, adjustment assistance program since President Kennedy. So there's no doubt about the fact that competition creates winners and losers. But the overwhelming evidence is that America has been a very great beneficiary from trade, that living standards are higher, that wages on average are higher, Not everybody has gained, but the great majority of people have been big gainers. Now, does that mean there's no problem if you lost your job in an area that either has been replaced by some modern technology or 
where you've got competition, which is competed away your job, it's a problem for you. But you can't stop society having the freedom to choose uh, goods that are better and cheaper. That's part of freedom. Have you heard anything in the various critiques of your book or in, in discussions with people? Have you heard anything that resonated with you that changed your mind that made you say, I wish we had taken this into account? We missed this. Well, uh, let me say, I have presented the book at Stanford, at the University of Chicago, at Harvard, with Larry Summers interviewing me. And I've heard arguments that there are a lot of supplemental measures that if you use them, they partially deal with the problem I'm talking about in terms of undercounting income. But the point is, people don't use them. They use the figures that the Census Bureau puts out as the official number. And I would say this, Bethany, I've been surprised that there haven't been more effective attacks on the book. If I were attacking the book, I would say, okay, what you say is clearly true. I mean, if you can add and subtract, it's clear that if you add up all the transfer payments and you take into account all the taxes, that the numbers are right, but those numbers are misleading in that food stamps aren't really worth what they cost. If you went out and said to people, you're getting $90 worth of food stamps this week, I'll give you $85 for the food stamps, would they take it? Some of them would, yeah. Now, I don't know why people have not made the argument. Maybe if you accept that argument, then you get into a debate that I have had at Chicago and Harvard, and that is, should we be doing all of this differently? Given that we're providing now almost $50,000 for the average household in the bottom 20% of income recipients, should we look at whether we need over 100 federal welfare programs? Should we look at whether providing all these things is as valuable as simply finding a way of giving people the money? Now, I haven't made a decision about that as to where I stand on it, but I think it is certainly a subject worthy of debate. Milton Friedman argued for guaranteed annual income. Now, I can see problems with it, but what do I see problems with what we're doing? So that's an area that should be explored. All I'm trying to do, I'm not trying to end the debate. I'm trying to start a debate. We're spending a lot of money. We need to admit it. We need to show the figures, and then we need to debate. Could we do this better? Thank you, Senator. That was great. Are companies that support ESG principles driving their own political agendas, or are they looking out for the long-term interests of shareholders? Join Chicago Booth's Rostandi Center and Stiegler Center in partnership with the Financial Times for a virtual event on June 21st. Is Corporate ESG Woke Capitalism? is part of the Unpacking ESG series. Panelists include Chicago Booth's Marianne Bertrand, former SEC Chairman Jay Clayton, Lafayette Square founder and CEO Damien Duin, moderated by Financial Times' Patrick Temple West. Register at chicagobooth.edu slash unpacking ESG. So Luigi, what did what did you think was the most interesting part of our interview? I really liked what one um, reviewer wrote, and, and Graham himself admitted this, and the reviewer wrote this. He said, however clear it is that the official numbers are skewed, unskewing the data is at least as much art as science, with numerous debates about which adjustments to make, and that readers should think carefully about the consequences of each decision that Graham and his, and his co-authors make. But I'd add to that, we should think carefully about the consequences of of everybody's decision as to what they count and what they don't count, right? Absolutely. But I have to say, and now I'm not an expert in income statistics or poverty, and I have to say that I was pretty surprised by how much money we actually transfer to the bottom 20% of the income distribution. But in a positive way, not in a negative way, I don't want to in any way sounds like I want to reduce, but the one point that, by the way, was started by 
my colleagues, Bruce Mayer, the high school before he made it. But the, the point that uh, we don't factor in in-kind payment is pretty remarkable because food stamps are clear sort of uh, money in your pocket, if you want. I know that you are less excited about adding Medicare, but I think that Medicare and Medicaid are real value to transfer to poor people. Oh, I agree with you. I think they're real value too. And I agree. Transfers in the form of Medicaid are real money. I guess I just questioned whether they're <laughs> dollar for dollar real real money. And I think Graham would ad- admit that that's a or, or agree that that's 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 a question you can ask. I mean, if I tell if I get a dollar of income and I get to spend that however I choose, and you get a dollar of Medicaid and you only get to spend it if you're sick in in a very specific place, I don't think that the two dollars are a equivalent. I think the dollars you're getting in Medicaid have, have value, but I, but, I, but I think arguing that they're equivalent is flies in the face of, of human nature. It's it, it, because people want choice about how they spend their money. And when even if they're being given money, if they're being told they have no choice how to spend it, and in this case, as one reviewer pointed out about Graham's book, the sicker you get, the richer you are, because the sicker you get, the more Medicaid you use, therefore the richer you are. There's, there's, something, there's something a little bit screwed out of about that. I can't help thinking over and over again. Again, as I said in our interview with Graham, it's you know, Marie Antoinette did not say let them eat cake, but this is a little bit of let them eat Medicaid. I disagree because honestly, we are actually trying to force people to get health insurance, right? Part of what Obamacare is, was about is to force everybody into enrolling in uh, health insurance. Medicare and Medicaid are the most generous health insurance that you can get in the United States. It's just in the private market, you cannot get an insurance with zero deductible and zero copayment. It's like uh, impossible. And Medicare gives you that. And by the way, they get doctors to perform at a lower price because they have volume. So at the end of the day, you are getting to poor people, in insurance that if they were to try to buy in the marketplace, like we are requiring the other to buy, they would spend a fortune. So I think that that's, we are actually more than dollar for dollar. I'm going to argue with you about that because, well, first of all, Medicare and Medicaid are really different. Medicare, it's much easier to find a doctor who will take it. Medicaid, it's damn near impossible to find a doctor who will take it because the reimbursements are so low. And even Medicare, uh, my parents just told me this, if they're really grateful that they didn't get the supplemental insurance that reduces your Medicare premiums to to nothing, because if you do that, it's also almost impossible to find a doctor who will who will take it. So it's a great benefit in theory and a little bit less of one in in reality when you actually try to try to find a doctor who will who will accept your insurance but even so even if i granted you your 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 point i would still disagree because i think that and i guess this gets into another part of my quibble with with graham but i still think that human nature being what it is if you have money and you can choose how to spend it versus having money and not being able to choose how to spend it it feels different and so these Transfer payments may be, no matter how you count them, it might be making up for some for some segment of the income gap, but it doesn't feel as good to the people who who are getting them as a dollar of a dollar of cash would, and that and that matters to the stability of our society. I agree with you that they don't feel the same, but again, the question is, what are we measuring and for what purpose? If we are measuring, is the person who is richer, how many times? richer he feels, or how big the difference. In that situation, because we are forcing the rich person to have health insurance anyway, he's not free to choose. He get, he has to get health insurance. So for that comparison purpose, I think it's fine to treat it dollar for dollar. If you are saying in an abstract sense, if uh, people were given the choice, would prefer to do something else? Absolutely. Yeah, you know, that's that actually is a fair point that that if you're very well off, you still have to spend the dollars getting getting health insurance. At least it's a really bad idea not to do that. So I think you have mostly convinced me with the side point, Medicaid dollars aren't as easy to spend as you would think, given the difficulty in finding doctors who will who will who will take that insurance. So okay. So I wanted to ask you about one other thing that I thought was missing from this analysis, which is that it's an analysis of income inequality, but it's not an analysis of wealth 
wealth inequality. And isn't wealth inequality, it's in some ways the result of income inequality, but but not entirely. There are all these statistics, and I don't have them at my fingers, but the percentage of the stock stock market wealth, for instance, that is held by the by, by the wealthiest people, and that's a number that has gone up dramatically over time. So when you've had something like the last couple of decades of super low interest rates and a really rising stock market, it's the well-off who have benefited in terms of wealth in a way that isn't captured in a, in a mere measure of income inequality. You are absolutely right. The problem is that if we're bad at measuring income, we're much worse at measuring wealth. So in preparation for this, I spent more time than I care to admit actually looking into this literature. And for example, a simple thing is how do you treat 10 million people who have a tax income return, but are listed as dependent in somebody else's income return. So your kids are, are, are still small, Bethany, but imagine you have a 15-year-old kid who does some work during the summer, has to file a tax return, but you cannot assess whether he or she is poor based on that tax return because she, I know he says she, lives with you, okay? That makes a big difference because 10 million of people with very low income They can be considered super poor or they can be considered actually wealthy kids or or kids or wealthy people who have summer jobs. And uh, the way that you treat them change dramatically how you think about income distribution. Oh my goodness, fun and great, fun and games with numbers for, for for sure. So another aspect of fun and games with with numbers is the numbers look really different if you're talking the top 20 percent, the top quintile versus the bottom quintile versus the top one percent versus the top point one percent. And I was thinking and wondering if you'd agree that that might explain or help explain why Graham's analysis seems to fly in the face of observed reality. By which I mean this analysis seems to imply a very equal America, and yet. We have all these stories of, you know, 30-year-olds with master's degrees who can't buy a home and a single mom working two jobs who can't afford an emergency medical payment and perhaps even more to the point, you know, stories about and truth about people being priced out of cities, coastal cities, and even in Chicago, wealthy coastal cities, New York, uh, San Francisco, LA, even even Chicago. And it, it those 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 facts just don't comport with a totally equal America, right? Yeah. Why the debate on income inequality is so pervasive? Because the debate or the inequality is really hitting where the educated class is. So most academics, most journalists, most talking heads are not particularly tuned in with the bottom 20% of the income distribution. As a result, they don't know whether they're doing better or worse. But we are very tuned in from the middle to the upper part of the income distribution, and that's where the dramatic changes are taking place. So uh, I think that the difference between the 0.1% and the 10% has increased dramatically over the last three decades. And so if you were in the top 90% of the income distribution, you felt like very rich in the past. And today, by comparison to anybody else, you feel poor. The the frightening thing about that is that revolutions are often started by those very people rather than the people at the very bottom end of of, of the spectrum. So it doesn't mean that society is more stable or there isn't something very wrong. It might mean that society is actually less stable because it is those people who are feeling inequality uh, in the most, who are feeling inequality most acutely. If you're enjoying the discussions Luigi and I are having on this show, there's another University of Chicago podcast network show you should also check out. It's called Big Brains. Big Brains brings you the stories behind the pivotal breakthroughs that are reshaping our world. Change how you see the world and keep up with the latest academic thinking with Big Brains, part of the University of Chicago podcast network. So I actually, Luigi, ended up thinking that his analysis was a little bit beside the point. And maybe I'm guilty of recency bias because we just finished our interview with David Autor. But in in my view, if we need transfer payments to fix the labor market, then something something is going wrong. Uh, there's a GAO report that was done fairly recently that finds that millions of full-time workers in the private sector are relying on federal health care and food assistance because they don't make enough in their jobs. So this isn't, I think, Graham's view that this is a problem of people who aren't working is is wrong. It's a problem also of people who are working but just can't get enough, make enough money to make ends meet. And that seems to me to be a, that seems to me to be the real problem. Do you agree? 
Yeah, by and large, I agree. I think, first of all, it's very confusing to mix the pre-tax distribution from the after-tax after tax and transfer distribution because your concern is exactly that the pre-tax distribution at the lower end is too low. That's a legitimate concern. And also the fact that a lot of people can't find a job or can't find a decent job, that's a serious issue. When, when I challenge him with what happened uh, uh, as a result of the China shock, he was completely untouched. I have a story and I stick to it no matter what. I didn't get a sense that there was any nuance, any willingness to even understand what was going on, nothing. He said, oh, there are losers, too bad for the losers. But then if they're losers and they don't work, is their problem. And, and I was trying to say, look, uh, especially if you are later in your life, it's not that easy to readjust. After all, uh, it's a policy choice to open up to China so fast. There are many policy choices. I don't think that uh, people need to suffer necessarily as a result of these policy choices. I think that it, it upset me because his whole point is we need to look honestly at the data. Even when the data isn't what you want to believe, you need to look honestly at the data so we can have a real policy discussion. And I absolutely agree with that. But then when it comes to looking at data he doesn't want to believe, which is data showing that people who are working full time and really trying can't make ends meet, he doesn't want to acknowledge that because that's not convenient with the ideological argument that the only problem with these people is they aren't willing to get off their butts. And that 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 bothers me. It feels hypocritical. Yeah, and I think that uh, he insists very very much on the correlation between increasing these payments and uh, increasing uh, prime age uh, workers who are not working, but he knows better than, than most that correlation is not necessarily causation, and he doesn't have any causal evidence of that, and I think this is where ideology comes in the picture. I think that he likes to portray a certain picture without really having the data to back it up. There have been some experiments where people receive, for example, some uh, transfer and see what impact they have on their willingness to work. I'm not an expert here, but uh, the majority of evidence is in favor that the effect is not that large because people want to work for other reasons. I think he's right. One point where he's right is to say that if you don't work, you are progressively left out yes, from uh, the improvement in everything. And I think that uh, that's actually, if you want, the biggest criticism of the universal basic income, that if you think that you are going to solve the problem by letting people at home, these people will become increasingly dissatisfied and increasingly marginalized. So I think it's very important to get everybody the opportunity to work but the conclusion that people don't want to work because it's too costly for them uh, to work, I think is a perfectly legitimate conclusion in theory. I don't think it applies so well in practice. And, and we economists are the worst in presuming that people behave according to our model rather than the way we behave. I was talking with a colleague, and this colleague would say, oh, these days, if I don't have the right incentives, I don't do anything. I said, wait, you dedicate most of your time to the school, I hope, in most of your time, you have zero incentive. You have tenure. There is nothing that pushes you to work. And still, you work your butt off. So I think that that's the proof uh, uh, by example that uh, uh, what you're saying is wrong. <laughs> I, I would agree with that. I'd also add one wrinkle to it that economists and maybe journalists too, I don't know, maybe no, maybe journalists are better at this than economists are. Economists are also the worst as assuming that what is a motivation for one person must be a motivation for somebody else. And the truth is people are wildly varied and people's makeup and their and their means and the ways they react to things are, are actually quite individualistic. And so it might be true. He might be right. For one person, it might be that they're making enough in transfer payments that they don't feel the need to get a job. But to say that that's true for one person might be true for one person is already already a guess. But to say it's true for the population at large, I think, is is quite tricky. You, you know what is funny? We didn't have time to ask him at the end, but I really wanted to ask whether he recognized himself in the Republican Party today or not. I did too. Not. I know. Because uh, you know that uh, he used to be a Democrat. I did not know that. Yeah. And actually, kudos to him. I read on this on Wikipedia, so it's not like I've done so, so much due diligence. But what what I admire is that uh, he ran as a Democrat, he got elected as a Democrat, and then the Democrat left him out of a important committee, and then he resigned on protest, 
and then he ran as a Republican for the seat he left open and re-entered Congress as a Republican. But at least did not flip inside the House. And this is, uh, he resigned and then asked for the voters the mandate to go back. But he's really, what, what, the reason why I bring him up, besides this interesting anecdote, is that uh, he is really a Reagan Democrat. Sort of uh, the attitude that you need to walk, but also with complete faith in uh, free trade, complete faith in the effect of uh, the incentives of taxes to work, etc. And today, I think you can find more people in the moderate part of the uh, Democratic Party that believe in that stuff. And that, but then you go to, remember when we interview Oren Kass, Oren Kass it would be completely at odds with him in, in the Republican Party. And if there is a more idealistic part of the Republican Party that goes behind the sort of the, the Trump slogan, I think he's, he's now connecting more with this uh, disenfranchised uh, working poor or non-working poor rather than uh, the t- traditional Roman Democrat like him. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. I also thought on a slightly different note, what was interesting is how powerful personal narrative is in shaping political beliefs. And I had not heard his personal narrative before, which is that he failed three grades and didn't learn to read until until he was a sophomore. I think he said a sophomore and obviously grew up quite poor. And so he believes strongly in lifting yourself by your bootstraps because that's his personal narrative. And so I think if I were to be very kind to him, I, I would say that he believes this narrative so so strongly, not because he's a bad human being who wants to keep the working poor down, and but, but because that's his story and it, and it worked for him. And so he firmly believes that that's, that's, that's the way to be. But it's interesting. You are right. I think that you're, you're making an excellent point. But what is also interesting is that I said, oh, not everybody is as lucky to have your kind of mama. And, uh, and of course, he went on a sort of uh, rant. Mama t- a r- my mama rant. Yes, he did. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but then he said something very important. He said, oh, you know, we can't fix that. And, and at some level, I agree with that, that we can't fix every difference in the world. However, it's true that having a loving parent is a gigantic benefit. And people who, for whatever reason, don't have one, they start the world at a severe disadvantage. And I don't see any reason why we should not uh, help them, especially in light of his view, because he's basically saying it should be a quality of opportunity, not of outcome. But if you start really without parents that take care of you, I think that you are really, really at a severe disadvantage. It's interesting. It harkens back to our episodes on meritocracy, right? That most of us, most of us who succeed rarely think we got lucky to have a loving parent. We think that we were able to succeed on our own merits without ever taking into account the the love that our parents did or didn't extend to us. And that clearly is purely a matter of luck. That has nothing to do with one's innate worthiness, right? <laughs> yeah, but he recognizes he was very lucky to have such a mother. The, the, ma- the mama oh, rant I'm- was precisely about that. The, the interesting thing is was not willing to help the people that are left behind because they're not as lucky as him. Well, he, he wasn't unwilling. It was, I, I, I never would have guessed before we did this recording that Phil Graham and, according to him, Milton Friedman were believers in UBI. And the idea that, that he might be a believer in UBI, it does seem, it flies in the face of a lot of what he was saying to me, because per his point and your point, people who don't work are left increasingly behind, and UBI is hugely problematic in, in, in that respect. And per David Autor's point, it, about the dignity of work. It doesn't address that 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 issue at all. But yet here's Phil Graham saying that maybe UBI is better better than what we do now, which I realize I'm pushing it a little bit by saying he recommended it. That's that's not quite what he said. He basically said it might be a better alternative to what we're doing. And I, I actually did agree with that point of his, that we are spending an awful lot of money. And if we're spending so much money, we should think about what it's doing. And that was a side point of what he said, but that's, that's true too. Yeah, I would say, first, I would give ourselves, and this is ourselves as U.S. government, a pat in the back saying, we are doing a lot. I think we don't hear very much. I think that uh, there is all this criticism about government on doing this, government doing, doing that. In this particular case, 
the war on poverty actually worked. Isn't that interesting? I, I was thinking when we were talking to him that uh, I would have rewritten his book for him, and I would have written it with a very different with a very different point, at least at the beginning, which was look at how successful the war on poverty has been. And so, rather than a title saying inequality doesn't exist, I would have put a title on it saying look at our great success and how well we've done. And he would have gotten a lot more readers that way. And you could have made all the same points, just in a slightly different order. And if you started with the fact that this has been so successful and then went into what it means for the future and what it means for actual inequality numbers, I think he would have gotten a lot more people to agree with him. <laughs> yeah, and the point is interesting because one uh, natural conclusion of your kind of book would be to say, why don't we do a little bit more and actually eradicate poverty? We have gone c- pretty close to do it, but uh, we need to do the last mile. Now, his point, which is a little bit more subtle, is maybe we can do the last mile in the same way in which we're doing that, which is possible, but I'm not seeing any statistic in his book actually making that uh, in a convincing way. So it would be interesting to, to, to say, look, uh, we have done 90% of the job with 30% of the money, but the last uh, 70% is really not doing very well. I think that would be a very interesting book. I'm not, it's not in his book, as far as I know. Capitalism is a podcast from the University of Chicago Podcast Network and the Stiegler Center in collaboration with the Chicago Booth Review. Also check out promarket.org, a publication of the Stiegler Center. The show is produced by me, Matt Hodap, and Leah Cesarine, with production assistance from Utsoff Gandhi, Sebastian Burka, Chris Wheat, and Brooke Fox. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review for Capitalism wherever you get your podcasts.